borders are going to shut down soon. We won't get to see any more Urchin Underpass. We won't get to see any more OG Hammerhead Bridge. We won't get to see any more pre-vandalized Mahi. We won't see any of it anymore. People don't even understand how peak this game's content is. Trash Tune 2 and Fraud Tune 3 could never. <laughs> What's that? When's the last time I played Splatoon 1? Well, recently I've been playing with the fresh season weapons, participating in Big Run, 100%ing Side Order, and partying it up in Inkopolis Square during the music Splatfest. So the last time I played Splatoon 1 was probably, um... Uh, a couple months ago. So the content of those two games might not be as bad as I claim, but Splatoon 1 was still amazing. We still got some time before the servers ride off into the sunset, so let me grab my Wii U gamepad from across the room and see how Splatoon 1 is holding up. I forgot Wii U games had these cool little intro screens for you to look at until the game loaded. This is also the closest we'll ever get to having apartment rooms in the series. Just a singular high definition picture of one. Oh god, I forgot you can skip the news in this game either, but unlike Turntable Tina, the Squid Sisters were at least swift with their news. Oh whoops, I probably should have waited for the rotation to be over before turning the game on. <laughs> Fuck! And just like that, we're in the weapon select screen. So many classics among this list of weapons. We have the OG Octo Shot with the Suction Bomb and Trizuka, the Grim Range Blaster with the Killer Whale and his Soulmate, the Burst Bomb, and the Zinc Mini Splatling, which would make you feel like a paralyzed person boxing Muhammad Ali if you were fighting it. There's also some weapons and reskins that never made into Splatoon 3. There's the hero weapons that you can get from the Splatoon Amiibo, which still give the New Order replicas in Splatoon 3 a run for their money, and the Dual Squelcher, which is basically the Dually Squelchers we have now before it got Malevolent Shrine. I can't forget about the abilities either. Most of these either directly made it in or were altered slightly in Splatoon 3, but a couple of these never made it back. There was Bomb Sniffer, which will warn you of any explosive sub-weapons near you and probably did more harm than good when the enemy team had a bunch of Bomb Rush players. And there was also Recon, which actually could be pretty funny to use in competitive if it was still around in Splatoon 3. Yeah, you would be a player down, but if the other three are cracked enough, you just have a 24-7 satellite tracking of the enemy team. Any other abilities that I'm missing? I don't think. Go away. How dare you curse my eyes with your presence again? Go! <sighs> All right, let's get into a match here. It's the last few days of Splatoon's online multiplayer still being playable, so we gotta find some people. This was just a group of eight people, too. Oh boy, I guess this will take a while then. Now we're cooking with gas, let's get it. Now allow me to show you just how powerful some of these weapons used to be. Just because you're in the blind spot of my main weapon doesn't mean I can't get to you. I got two maids of damage up that would absolutely love to meet you. Elyr was as good up close as it was from afar. I, I know we have paintable walls here, but you just watched that go down? People say Splatoon 3's maps are very easy to bottleneck, but remember when we could just do this on Black Belly? We got two chargers that can partial charge up top, a carbon roller with a bunch of damage up in your base, and a brush on patrol making sure none of you try anything funny. And Mink and Zooka, baby, the best special of all time when the paintings would neutralize its shots. <laughs> Why no matter what Splatoon game I play and where I position myself on the map, there's always a carbon roller above me. Flying Octoshot again in this game is like putting on a glove. <laughs> And fighting Luna Blaster in this game is like getting pimp slapped with one. Oh my god! Disruptor is such a funny sub weapon. Players are hit by it and basically have their ability to move halved, while I can just slosh around them as mindlessly as ever. There's a reason Toxic Mist had to replace this thing. It's no use! I have the bubbler and you can't touch me! That guy was a hacker and still had to jump away from the bubbler disruptor combo. That's how terrifying this kid is! Huh? Unsurprisingly, we lost that match. I forgot how much of a temper tantrum Inklings would have when they lose, too. These guys are like, NANI! And I'm like, well, my weapon is broken, but not that broken. And if the four hour rotations that only let you play Turf War in one rank mode are too slow for you, because why wouldn't it be, you can gather some peeps together and play some private battles. I gotta say, some of Splatoon 1's map mode combos have truly stood the test of time. You had things like Splat Zones on Urchin Underpass, Tower Control on Mahi Mahi, and Splat Zones on Walleye Warehouse. <laughs> This isn't a sarcastic bit, by the way. Walleye is awesome, and we need to give her the love she deserves! And there are also maps like Tower Control on Salt Spray Rig, Tower Control on Port Macro, and Rainmaker on Piranha Pit. <laughs> These were all shadow banned from appearing in ranked at some point during the game's history. But it's good to come back and look at the peak and the weak of Splatoon 1's maps with some friends and not have to worry about losing your ranks. For the first game in the series, Splatoon 1's single player wasn't that bad either. It was nothing to really write home about, it was a lot of simple platforming and enemy splatting like a Mario game, but that doesn't mean it wasn't fun. There was also the side of absolutely traumatizing lore dumps that were scattered throughout the levels which gave you the incentive to look around every corner of them. The single players eventually would lead to the Octo expansion and side order 
Order, as well as Splatoon's really messed up world building for an E10 shooter by Nintendo. And of course, I couldn't forget about the shopkeepers scattered around the plaza. They appear in Splatoon 3 as well, but it's nice seeing them before their glow-ups in this game. I especially have a soft spot for Mo and how he's basically the equivalent of today's YouTube commenter. I haven't forgotten about you either, Spike, and your absolutely archaic way of upgrading gear in this game. With Spike, you could just order and re-roll gear, and to do the latter, you need at least one Super Sea Snail, which you can only get during Splatfest. I'd say safe scumming was just cheating back then, but when this is your other option, Come on. Overall, it's been great returning to Splatoon 1 again. It's crazy how the franchise that got its start on one of the least successful Nintendo consoles of all time grew into the giant that it is now, getting two different installments in 10 years with many more likely to come. A lot of those who picked up this game when they were kids or young adults grew up with the franchise and met many amazing people because of it. The franchise also grew up with Inklings and Octolings being more expressive with each iteration, the story of the game progressing with each entry, and many features being added in over time. If there's one thing that the old geezer of the Splatoon franchise should leave us with before it goes riding off into the sunset, it's this. Give us a local multiplayer option like the Battle Dojo that only uses one Switch, please. The Joy-Cons are made for local multiplayer. You got two more seasons of Splatoon 3 left, Nintendo. Do not falter!